Hello, my name is Amy Lizer, and I'm the Executive Director of the Monroe County Historical Association, and I'd like to welcome you to our monthly third Thursday lecture series. I'm very happy to introduce tonight's speaker to you. Local historian Kathleen Sant has been collecting vintage memorabilia and postcards from the Delaware Water Gap and Pocono Mountain regions for 30 years. Tonight, Kathleen takes us back in time and shares voices from the past through postcard images and the words scribbled on their backs. Kathleen is from Canadensis. She holds two degrees in history from East Stroudsburg University and has been employed with the National Park Service for more than 20 years. Please feel free to type any questions you may have during the, in the, through the Q&A function and I'll ask them following the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome Kathleen who will give us her presentation in their words, a postcard history of the Water Gap and beyond. Kathleen, are you there? I am, thank Hello. you. Oh, welcome. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we can go ahead and get started right away. Just give me Sounds a second. Sounds good. There. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We appreciate it. One second. All right, can, I, can you see that, Amy? All right, am I good? I, I can see it, I think. All right, so thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be here, although I prefer to be in person with everybody this evening. Um, it's a whole lot more fun that way. I really appreciate Amy and Monroe County Historical Association putting together this type of, of lecture so that we can actually still get together in this format. So I hope that tonight um, you'll sit back, relax a little bit, um, and listen while I present, in their words, a postcard history of the water gap and beyond. My husband and I, as Amy said, started collecting local memorabilia and postcards about 30 years ago when we purchased our first set of cards at a yard sale at a friend's house in Delaware Water Gap. Uh, Olivia Kaiser, I see that you're out there on the call. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, Olivia's mom sold me those first postcards. Um, and later on, I went, went on to um, be able to purchase some from her grandmother's collection as well. So thanks for being here. Um, there was something about those little pictures that just caught my eye, caught my attention. Um, they were nostalgic. They were little works of art. They were soothing, they were pretty. But more important than that, which caught my eye, um, was that they were, they moved me because they were places that I knew. They were places that I saw, that I stood, that I could go and be in those places. And to me, that was fascinating because it gave me a really interesting look back in time. And in other cases, those pictures showed me places that I'd only heard about places that were lost only to photographs and memories. And it gave a glimpse into what things looked like and what people were doing. We only paid a couple dollars for that little stack of cards, but as many of you who probably have a little stack of postcards, they are instantly priceless treasures. Um, and that's how it starts, right? As soon as you um, get that little collector bug, you get started and you can't stop. And I would bet anything that some of you out there on this call today um, have been bitten by that collector's bug, whether it started with a pocket full of cool rocks that you found along the, along the trails where you walked um, or um, you know, whatever it might be for you. I'm sure there are some other collectors who understand. But one time when I was sorting through cards, you know, organizing, placing things in different categories, I really started to pay attention to the messages on the backs of the cards. I noticed things like postmarks from towns that didn't exist anymore. I noticed a few interesting words that were scribbled on the back or maybe an interesting address or a name. And those little things started to catch my eye. And once I started to flip those cards over and look at what was on the back of them, that really changed forever the way that I look at these little snapshots in time. Uh, where's my new button? All right. So a lot of collectors prefer those mint, unused um, postcards, right? They're the, the, the cream of the crop. Um, and this is a scene from Mount Bethel, um, an early 19th century, I'm sorry, early 20th century scene. These postcards are brand new. 
even though they date back to the early 20th century. These postcards were in storage in the Mount Bethel Inn, which is the building here on the left. Um, when my in-laws purchased it in the 80s, they found stacks of some of these postcards that were wrapped up and had never seen the light of day. Chances are these scenes were sold at the Mount Bethel Inn and probably at that little ice cream shop across the way. Um, and so while a lot of people like these unused cards, my favorite cards, as I mentioned, are the ones that tell us a little something, that give us a message that somebody else who passed through this area before we did left for us and for other people. So I would like to share some of those with you and give some voices. But first, I bet everybody out there has sent or received a postcard at some time. It's just one of those things, right? We've all done it. And usually, whether you've sent it or received it, they say similar types of things. They say, I'm off somewhere awesome having a fun time while you're at work. We're doing great. We had great food. We saw and did great things. Maybe mention the weather. You would love it here. Miss you, if that's appropriate. Signed and sent. These messages haven't changed very much in the past century, though the way we send and, send and receive messages certainly have. But despite all of the modern technology that's available to us, postcards still remain popular. Postcards, like our modern technology, were great for sending messages like, great day, like, I'm ha sorry, I'm having a swell time, like this card dated 1908. Today, I send a message instantly to all of my friends on Facebook that says, great day for a hike with a friend. The messages aren't all that different. It's just the way we deliver them and the way we receive them. Postcards today, again, they're available everywhere that you go. They're available in convenience stores. They're available in our gift shops. They're available in grocery stores. Gas stations sometimes even have them. Um, and again, they still remain extremely popular. Postcards can be used for communicating all kinds of things. From what's for dinner, the supper at the church Thursday night is creamed oysters and waffles, not chicken supper. In this message from 1917 to Sarah in Walpack Center, New Jersey. Or me telling all my friends I found this great new Polish market in Mount Pocono. Or my friend sharing his son's first ice cream sandwich. Food is really important to everybody throughout the generations. Postcards also can communicate things like, at the baggage station car, nothing to do but wait, or shipping out again, as my friend Tom, who's a wildland firefighter fighting on the, the western slopes of Montana and combating some of those wildfires. This is how we keep up with him. This is how we know he's safe. This is how we know where he is. And he reaches all of us in one keystroke. So again, I'm thrilled to be here tonight and thank everybody for coming out and joining us and giving me your time. I'm looking forward to sharing some of my favorites with you and giving voice to those messages from the past. I'm not gonna delve deeply into the history of postcards or, or into the uh, intricacies of collecting, but I am gonna touch on some of the different time periods um, because that's something that I often get asked about. So I've um, framed my presentation this evening around those time periods, although there are always exceptions. If you look at this card here, this is that 19th century, um, I'm sorry, I keep messing my centuries up today. This is that early 20th century postcard that spread a stair in the boat at Lake Lenape, right? This is the postcard that every collector wants to have in their collection. This postcard was picked up at an antique shop and postmarked 1979. If you look at it, you think at first, wow, this is a great vintage card, and it is. But when you flip it over, you see, again, that somebody purchased it. So darlings, we're nowhere near the Delaware Water Gap, but thought this little antique might amuse you. Now this card's printed in Germany, but it has a 10 cent stamp and a postmark that'll trick you. So there are never any hard and fast rules. You can't always go by the postmark. You can't always go by the stamp. You can't always go by the card or the style. So there's always gonna be those um, exceptions. I'm also not gonna talk at all about value. I don't put a value on cards. Um, they range from 
you know, a, a bucket a yard sale sometimes to um, exorbitant amounts um, when you can purchase them online sometimes. Um, I don't talk about the value because to me, the value is not monetary. The value is in these priceless little messages, the information that they tell us and the stories that they tell us. So today I'm gonna to share some of those. The um, first picture postcards began selling in Europe in the 1870s, and they didn't reach the United States for another 20 years or so. The earliest postcards that were in use here were only used for advertising and very short messages. They didn't have pictures, they weren't pretty, they weren't really all that worth collecting. But the first picture postcards were sold at the Columbian Exposition, the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893. And when those first picture postcards were sold, it became an instant communication hit. It became the choice for American travelers and tourists, as well as neighbors and friends and family members. The earliest postcards uh, with pictures on them in the United States were, um, uh, were known as private mailing cards. They didn't even use the term postcard at this point. These were in use between 1808, 1898 and 1901. Um, Writing was not allowed on the back of the card. So the side that we see on the bottom here, um, you were only allowed to write your address there and your message had to be written in the small white space. This early card was sold by the High Falls Hotel near Dingman's Ferry, um, near Dingman's Falls actually. Um, and it features the Dingman's Ferry landing. So remember these cards date from 1898 to 1901. In 1900, the current span of the Dingman's Ferry Bridge was put in place. The previous span had been washed out by a flood. And so this little snapshot in time shows that period of transition where the ferry was put back into use until the bridge was put back in. It's a great example of a card from this period. And then around 1900, we started to see real photo postcards. Um, this was where uh, an actual photographic process, uh, photos could be printed on postcard stock, um, just like this picture here of the water gap from Tunnel Hill. These postcards remained popular for decades. Postcard, postcard styles changed again after the turn of the century. Between 1901 and 1907 is what collectors call the era of the divided back, I'm sorry, the undivided back postcard. Okay, so again, we're looking at the back of the postcard. It's one open spot. And the only thing that you're allowed to write on the back is the address. And that's usually where the postmark would be. On the front, you would have a small picture and then white space. So think Twitter, trying to fit 140 characters into a short message on the front of that card. Um, this is from uh, Egypt Mills Hunting Club, just north of Bushkill, and it dates to 1905. Haven't forgotten your postals, and we'll send them soon. It's hot here today. See, the weather is always something important to mention. During this time period, postcard publication doubled every six months as the popularity grew. And at this time, most cards were made in Germany. About 75% of them were actually made in Germany. In this example of an undivided back card from 1904, Margie writes to Gus, those sore feet of Ma's are a great big fake as she walked about six miles today over the mountain and then said she could eat a brick house. I do not like to be a telltale, but felt it my duty to expose her. Love to all, Margie. Dear Cora, we are all well. Wellness and sickness are extremely popular themes. We hear those quite a bit, even today. How are you? I hope you're well. I hope this email finds you well. And of course, the score. Milford three, Yale four. One in the last of the minute. This must have been a great game because the Yale School of Forestry was located in Milford. This must have been, I, I have to wonder if this wasn't some sort of a, of a rivalry. And obviously it was a close, a close game that went right down to that last minute. Dear Ruth, I hope you're a good girl for grandma. I wish you could be here with me. With love from Papa, 1906 from the Caldano Golf Links in Delaware Water Gap. And just like our modern technology, postcards can also be used for gossip. 
N's wedding was a sham. JP was pretty mad about it too, Clayton. The wedding was a sham. I, my imagination runs wild. What happened? Who's JP? Is JP the justice of the peace? Was JP the groom, bride? Who's JP? What on earth happened here? It's not fair that that's all they told us. I wish there was more to this story. And then in 1906, Kodak came out with a folding pocket camera on which the public, anybody, could take real photos and print them out on postcard stock. Imagine that, taking photos with a camera that fits in your, not quite in your pocket. These are the Kodak girls here showing off that camera. These became really popular because now we started to see anybody being able to take those really interesting images. And so postcards that we see that were taken with these cards often feature people family members, unique places, not maybe your tourist attraction or um, maybe sometimes the off the beaten path, the family farm, things like that. Um, and these cards became extremely popular and they're always really fun to look at. Like this one, dear Ruth, we are selling these. I hope you have no objections. Love to all. Why don't someone write me, Warren? This is Adams Creek in 1907, which by the way, standing up there on those waterfalls on those rocks is extremely prohibited right now. Um, but I have to wonder, why would Ruth mind if they were selling these cards? Is she the person who's featured in the card? Did she take the picture? Why would she mind? And why doesn't somebody please write to Warren? Here we have a glimpse of a white Christmas in 1904, Christmas day. Received package okay last evening, many thanks. Need more space to tell you how I, how I appreciate the lovely gift you sent. Haven't have had a lovely Christmas. Santa was the best ever, has been snowing all day. Attended an SS entertainment last evening, will write later, lovingly, Elizabeth. Does it look almost like summertime in New Jersey? It does up here in the mountains, writes Elizabeth from Cresco. Friday, I made my last seven mile walk to Barrett High School. Next September, I will be a senior. Do you intend coming to Promised Land fishing this summer? Sincerely, Elizabeth Price, May 23rd, 1905. Pictured is the original Barrett Friendly Library, now the Barrett Community Center. Seven miles, kids, uphill both ways. It's there, it's in writing. The golden age, as some would call it, for postcards and postcard collecting was from 1907 to 1915. Here, we have a not so cheerful message postmarked from Egypt Mills in 1910. Pretty hard, but I guess it will get to this. Hard to be poor. And if you look closely, the fun thing is you can zoom in on these. Um, if you look closely, we'll see that there is a sign at that intersection that points to the left to Stroudsburg and to the right towards Port Jervis. And it says Port Jervis 15 miles. So we can get a great idea on exactly where that, um, where that photo was taken. Cards from this era are, are, are identified by their divided back, right? So we, we made up these names a long time after these cards were popular. That refers to this line down the back. The message would be written on one side and the address would be written on the other, and they usually featured a larger photo. By 1908, postcard collecting had been the greatest collectible hobby that the world had ever seen. It was a public addiction. In 1908, the US Postal Service reports that there were 700 million postcards that passed through the, the US Postal Service, 700 million. The US population in 1908 was 89 million. And so that would mean that if every American citizen was doing their part, they'd be sending an average of eight postcards that year. By this time, again, most cards were still printed in Germany, who was the world leader in lithography until, the, or until World War I. Um, during the war, English and United States producers tried to fill the market, um, but they just weren't as good at it. And the product was a little bit, um, it was more, it was inferior. Um, the poor quality, the war, its shortages um, caused a decline in the hobby eventually, but there were also some exceptions. And also around this time, the telephone began to be used as a means of keeping in touch. Speaking of phones, can you hear me now? This is where Dingman Central is located. 
had a pleasant call Friday. Do not understand much you say on the phone. Guess at most of it. Write a letter if you have time and send one of last week's papers. Still today, it's hard to get a phone call out on D at Dingman's Ferry if you're looking at a, at a, a cell signal. On August 19, 1908, M.R. Bird writes to Mrs. H.N. Miller of Newark. We're taking this drive this afternoon. Flossie is enjoying herself in great style. Once automobiles were available, auto touring became an extremely popular activity, one that is mentioned often in these little messages. Now let's keep an eye on Flossie. We're gonna hear more from her in just a minute. So Mrs. Bird and Mrs. Miller are gossiping some more a week later. Um, they are definitely doing their part to keep the postcards flying through the mail. Thank you so much for the pretty postals, Mrs. Bird writes. Still more for the kindly thoughts which sent them. This is the place that Flossie has her eye on for her future residence. You needn't expect her home for a long time as she has to capture the air. Who on earth does Flossie have her eye on? Well, wouldn't we all like to live at Gray Towers? Um, I think we've all had our eye on that for our dream residence. If you've ever visited Gray Towers National Historic Site in Milford, um, that air would be Mr. Gifford Pinchot. Good luck, Flossie. Arthur confides in Lizzie in this 1908 message mailed from Cresco. Haven't had time to go to Sunday school yet. I'm having a good time. Hunting and fishing, we all know, are very popular activities here in the Poconos, and it's a tradition that continues today. Here, we have a letter from a father to his son, Bill, downriver in Easton. Dear Bill, been out after rabbits last Saturday afternoon for two hours. It was rough and windy. Seen nothing but red squirrels, did not do a shot. Fishing, I guess, is just as bad up here, for everybody goes after them. Send me by mail one pair of number seven shoelaces cut 34 inches long. I am well, but have a cold, tell mama. Signed, Papa. While Bill's father wasn't having much luck, the girls saw things a little bit differently. And Elliot writes, having a bully time here, fine fishing. I mean, for girls. And Pauline writes, dear dad, Mill and I caught a couple of strawberry bass this morning. We might have caught more, but we ran out of bait. Better come and try them. And proof that even family connections couldn't guarantee you a room in the Delaware Water Gap during the busy summer season. In this card from 1908, Aunt Alice writes, Dear Cora, your card received, and I'm sorry, but my house is filled now. And after these people leave, I'm expecting other boarders. Perhaps I may be able to entertain you later in the summer. Love to all, Aunt Alice. Wah, wah. And then in 1924, Mrs. Jackson, who likes the focus on the bright side writes, having nice weather, but have had bad news from home. Our house has been robbed. We'll tell you about it when I see you. Love, Mrs. Jackson. This is one of my favorites. Um, it reads more like a journal entry. There is no address, there's no name, there's no postmark. It was never sent. You can even close your eyes and listen in on this one and I think you can probably imagine what it was like. October 2nd, 1910, Kittatinny. We, father, mother and I arrived at the Kittatinny about quarter to eight in the evening on Monday, October 2nd, 1910. We had just ridden up a bad mountain road and were glad to get there. We had two rooms and a private bath, numbers 203 and 207. The supper was elaborate, but very poorly cooked, although it was served beautifully. We sent a few postals after supper, took a short walk and went to bed. There were deers and pheasant in the park belonging to the hotel. Forgot to mention the fact that no less than half a dozen porters surrounded the automobile when we drove up. That tells us so much about what it would have been like to roll up to the Kittatinny at 8 p.m. 
in 19, oh, 19, sorry, I lost my year, 1910. Emily also writes about her stay at the Kittatinny House in 1914. Here at the Kittatinny, think we're going to enjoy everything. Nice and warm and we've been outdoors all day. Too tired to put on my evening gown. I'm sure all you ladies are thinking that. Don't we say that all the time? And while postcards are often associated with travelers, we also see that some messages don't travel very far from home at all. Here, Lee from Delaware Water Gap writes her friend in East Strasburg on a chilly October morning in 1914. I suppose you're sitting near the fire warming your toes today. We had some snow, beat you. Bet you didn't get any up there. Goodbye, Lee. And I'll just leave this um, one star Yelp review right here for a minute. Um, this is one of the first one star Yelp reviews. Um, this is pretty country, but too many city people as a rule. It is cooler and not so crowded as the seashore. 1911, 110 years ago. By 1915, there were no German cards available on the market anymore, and high tariffs started to force other Europeans out of the market. Quality continued to decline, and it was expensive to produce them. Inks and paper became expensive. So to save on ink, which was pricey, cards in this era will often have a white border around the edge. By the time you produce a whole bunch of these, you're going to save a little bit of ink each time. Um, sales and interest, again, continued to decline. They weren't quite as popular, but there were some exceptions, including those real photo postcards that I mentioned earlier and the hand-tinted uh, postcards that I'm going to talk about in just a minute. During this time period, movies also began to replace postcards as a visual experience. And while people had fewer pennies to spend uh, on hobbies, they were still able to travel. Postcard images during this era tend to feature things like um, there are things that are inspired by patriotism or the awe of the beauty of uh, our country. Um, it's inspired by things like natural wonders and monuments, roadside attractions, engineering wonders like roads and bridges, and architectural accomplishments like buildings and skyscrapers. And other than skyscrapers, there's plenty of material to fit that bill right here in the Pocono Mountains in our surrounding area. On July 16th, 1920, Agnes writes her mother, we have a pleasant room on the second floor with a large bed, a little table and two chairs. The village has improved greatly, many new stores and ice cream places. Agnes Bennett and her sisters, Georgina and Frances were frequent summer visitors at the Gap. And I've been able to figure that out because I have about 30 different postcards over a 10 year period that they wrote home to their parents in Hackensack. And mom must have been sticking those in a box somewhere. And so when you look back over these over time, you see them talking about the village and then comparing how it, the village of Delaware Water Gap has changed over time. And it was their handwriting that actually first caught my eye and where I started to see those similarities. We're going to hear a little bit more from Agnes in a bit. Here's one featuring a beautiful piece of architecture. This is the old stone house in Dingman's Ferry. It's right at the foot of the Dingman's Ferry Bridge. Um, if you look closely at your card sometimes, you might see little X's or dots. Um, sometimes people will mark where their room was. And so this card was never sent, but the person who had it wrote, X is where my bedroom is. There were nine rooms and two halls. It is a stone house and there's always cobwebs and spiders. I think we can all relate to that. And then the hand tinted postcards. Those are probably among every collector and admirer's favorites. They are truly works of art and they were in use from 1906 to 1920. They spanned numerous different types and styles of postcard production, and they were among the most popular. Hand-tinted cards began in France and Belgium, and they were actual photos printed on paper that were hand-colored. Um, teams of trained artists, female artists, would sit in a circle or in a line, and each would have a different color and a very thin and narrow brush, and they would each be responsible for one color, do the coloring, and then pass it on to the next woman. 
each time dipping the brush between their lips to make sure that they had a nice fine brush. They were using lead paints. And so think Radium Girls, right? The new movie that's, that's, uh, that was out recently. Um, it was not a healthy practice and that was eventually discontinued. But I do think that this 1908 message summarizes this image nicely. I'm having a swell time, dancing every evening and rowing and bathing and walking every day. And without words, this epic view from the Water Gap House veranda, the epitome of leisure and relaxation with plenty of cool, fresh, healthy air. If you listen, you can almost hear the creaking of the rockers on the wooden floorboards. This 1912 message shows that no matter how pretty the scene, like this woodland path around Lake Lenape, postcards were also for serious business. Ella says, please let the chickens out in the morning before going on to discuss lunch. Having a delightful time is the message on this absolutely delightful view of the Delaware Water Gap and its three mountains, the Triple Mountain View, sent in 1908. And here we hear from Agnes back in 1911. So we're going back a, a, almost a decade from when we heard from her last time. Today, G and I took the double ferry over to the New Jersey side and visited Caramac Inn. It's roasting hot everywhere except in our room. And then she went on to explain to her father that the cool breezes that filtered through the, her room um, kept them nice and cool. This is July 2nd. The next day, Georgina writes to her mother. Dearest mama, this is a beautiful day and last night was cool and lovely. We walked to Lake Lenape after supper and heard a bird singing what a German musician called a wonder song. We came back and sat in the swing and watched millions of fireflies. So we were really very comfy. Agnes is indefatigable, but my legs are longer, so I have more to tire me. Love to all. And Georgina's sentiments are shared in this August 1920th description, August 1920 description of a typical week at the Gap. Dear Dorothy, we have been out on the river every day this week. We spent nearly all of yesterday morning in the boat. There are some beautiful places around here with love, Aunt Flora. Again, postcard styles change around the 1930s and we start to see these cards that are called linen cards, replacing the others on the wax. These cards were in those postcard racks probably up until the 1960s in some area. You will recognize them because they have a textured look like linen um, and they have a, a bright, bright colors. They have a higher rag content in the paper, which allows them to absorb a lot more ink. And so we tend to see really bright, almost overly bright colors sometimes, more um, brighter than, than what you would see in, in real life a lot of times. Um, there were shortages during World War II and old stock was often sold. Um, and again, just as a note too, sometimes you will see the same image used throughout all of the different periods. If there was a really good picture and it was really popular, you might see it as a black and white. You might see it as a color image. It could be hand tinted. It could come out with a white border and you might even see it translated into a linen postcard later on. These brightly colored cards were often popular with roadside establishments as auto touring became more and more popular. This postcard featuring riders on horseback outside the stables at Buck Hill Inn reads like an early visitor bureau advertisement. The only thing wrong up here is that time goes too fast. That's from the 1940s. And here in 1956, Helen writes to her dear friends at the Astatic Corporation in Ohio that she's having a swell time and that the weather is grand. I'm not sure what other message you would expect on a postcard as brightly colored and cheerful as this one. In 1945, Alan writes to his uncle, Dear Uncle Dave, how are you and everyone else? We're still up here in Bushkill despite, of the, despite the rain. 
I'm doing a lot of fishing and shooting. I'm running out of ammunition and can't get it at the general store. Will you please ask Bill to send me some and enclose the price so I can send him the money? Best regards to all, Alan. I can imagine that it might have been a little bit difficult for him to get ammunition in 1945. And this poignant message always touches me. It's postmarked August 4th, 1949 and sent to the captain of the Salvation Army in Eastern Pennsylvania. Dear captain, I went back on Monday morning, but there was no one around. So I came up here and got a job. I wanted to do some work for the shoes. I'm working for the Glenwood Hotel. I wanted to thank you for the shoes. Yours truly, Jay. And of course, postcards got brighter and shinier as time went on. These photochrome era postcards um, are, became popular in the 1930s and they are very similar to what we still see on the postcard racks today. Um, 1939, The Wizard of Oz came out and Technicolor was all the rage. And so we see that reflected in these postcard images as well. Um, the first photochrome postcards were actually sold in service stations in, West, um, in the Western United States. And they eventually replaced those linen cards in postcard racks. And of course, this is the example that I found in my office today and I had to include at the last minute. Um, this is uh, Dingman's Falls Visitor Center and it says, Dear Stella, postmark 1975. This was vacation time for us. Prince Edward Island, then Amish Dutch Pennsylvania, and then through the Poconos. This shop is about to become a state park and probably will be closed. So this is probably a collector's card. Little did she know. And it's actually part of Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area today. It was acquired in 1978, so shortly after this card was, was written. So I hope that you enjoyed hearing these messages from the past this evening. Um, these little glimpses into what people were thinking and doing, which really aren't all that different from what we're doing and thinking today, what visitors who come here to experience this area are doing today, often in the same places where these people walked generations before us. I'm sure you've been there and I bet you had a swell time too. So thank you for joining me tonight. And if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat box and I'll take your questions. Amy, take it away. Hello, that was wonderful, thank you. And I, I know you couldn't hear me, but I was definitely chuckling and uh, giggling <laughs> here at some of those postcards. You know, it really makes sense that sending postcards during this time really exploded. I mean, wasn't this the time that increased travel, you know, with, with roads and lines and things like that. So it really does, it does make sense, doesn't it? Yeah, an increased leisure time too. And we start to see how people right. are expanding with that leisure time and over the time period too. In the beginning, we see a lot of things as, as we kind of know, focused around Delaware Water Gap, right? But then as the automobile became more and more popular, we start to see a lot more of those attractions that are farther out into the Poconos, places that people were actually getting in their cars and going to. So it kind of shows that pattern in local history that we already knew but mm -hmm. here we can hear it from those people firsthand. Yeah, I think that's really neat. That's something that really struck me. And that, that Kittatinny Hotel, the script was beautiful on that, that one postcard. Yeah, I'd love to have the rest of his, if they you know kept track of that, it would be fantastic. Right, and I'm with you about that wedding. I need to know what's going on there. We need to know papers or something when that thing was posted, postmarked. Yeah, I, I almost suspect Flossie might have been involved. <laughs> she probably was. Yep. Okay, so a couple of questions have come in. Um, what is the furthest destination address in your collection? Do you mean where they were sent or? Yeah, where they were sent. I saw one, you know, one from Connecticut. Oh. I didn't know mm -hmm. just that, but do you have any that are? I had one that I really wanted to include, but I couldn't translate it because it was written in German and postmarked Delaware Water Gap, but sent to Germany. Um, I'm sure it was absolutely fantastic and they said great things, um, right. but I, ha I have no idea what the translation is. So I think that's the one that um, was sent the farthest. And then how that got back here, I, yeah, I have no idea. And the fact that it was probably printed in Germany. Originally, right. Yeah. Yeah. Sent back to Germany and now it's back right. here. 
house. And, you know, and now, it's in, now it's in Canadensis. Right? <laughs> that's a well-traveled postcard, that's for yeah. Um, Can you put the, the last slide back up for us? Can you? Um, I think you up? have control of my screen right now. Can I still share? You're sure you're still sharing. Oh, I am? Mm -hmm. So does this end the slideshow? So can you, you click to exit it? Uh, have your... I said this says I am still screen sharing. There we go. So, that's there we go. Saying. That's good. Perfect. Perfect. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's good. No, that's good. That's good. Um, let's see. More questions. Someone who made a comment that about the, the too many city people, certainly a very common comment that we still hear today. Yeah, in, quite the theme on social media these days. Mm -hmm. um, a person did want to know if the Kittatinny Hotel was is still standing. It is not. Um, it burned in 1930. Um, however, if you go along Route 611, just outside of the town of Delaware Water Gap, the resort point overlook, it's part of Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area, stands on the location and you can still see the remains of the fountain that used to be in front of the Kittatinny House. So it is not still standing, but you can still go to that place and you can still look from that overlook and feel what it would have been like to look at that view. Perhaps not from so high up, but um, you can still get a feel for that. I love that that overlook is still there. And when you see the yeah. Kittatinny, just imagining what it must, must look like, because it's impressive now, right. you know, on, on the level. But without the highway in it. Right, right, yes, of course. Yeah. Great question. Another a question. How close are Kittatinny and Buck Hill? And was Buck Hill the exclusive place it has been in our lifetime? Um, so Kittatinny and Buck Hill. Um, I used to work at Kittatinny and I live about five minutes from Buck Hill. And it's about a 35 minute drive. Um, modern day today it takes me about 35, 40 minutes to, to make that trip. Um, Buck Hill was, um, Buck Hill Inn was established, I believe it was 1901. Um, it was a resort area, cottages were built up around the inn. Um, it's still, um, it's still in existence today, although the inn is no longer standing, the Buck Hill Falls community is still, um, is still an active community today. And the grounds where the Buck Hill Inn used to be are now a township park. So you can still go visit that area too and see parts of the foundation and the ruins and some of the other um, structures that are around that area. Yep, we have some comments. Just you did a great job. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh, thank you. Um, we answered that one. This is wonderful. Do you have anything from Raymondsburg Ho Homestead in New Jersey? Spring, uh, I think it was called. Yeah, Ramseyburg Homestead. Ramsey I do not. I would love to find something from Ramseyburg, especially with messages on it. It talks about what it was like, but, um, but I do not. Right, right. Um, what is your most prized possession in your collection? Um, I don't think it's really, I don't think there's one, you know, of course there's ones that are favorites. I mean, I love the ball gap, the evening gown one, right? That, that message is just like so I'm just too tired to put on my evening gown. I, I, I just can't even relate. Um, well, we don't have ours on tonight, so I guess I don't have mine tonight. No, <laughs> um, so I don't. I wouldn't say that I have a favorite because when you look at them, when you kind of look at the stories that they tell and the messages that kind of come out of them, that's my favorite part about them um, and how different some of them are, but also how similar they are and literally how similar they are to things that my friends and I send back and forth to each other on Facebook when we're traveling um, or, you know, that my daughter will text me, um, you know, I'm at school ready to be picked up. Well, he was at the station baggage car, nothing to do but wait. And so, so similar. And so we haven't changed all that much. And it's so funny because, you know, the postcards aren't instantly sent. I mean, how long would it take for a postcard? You know, you're saying all like, oh, let the chickens out or not right. wait. Well, they're not going to get this for several days, I would assume. Right. Sometimes. Yeah. Yep. Right. Right. Uh, was there a certain postcard that first piqued your interest in collecting? Yeah, I would say they were those first postcards. Um, they came from um, the uh, the. Um, a house in Delaware Water Gap. It was at one point part of the Mountain House property. It was known as Sunset Cottage. Um, my best friends, Brad and Kelly Kaiser, lived there. And so we went to their yard sale and they had these cards. And 
it was literally right there and next door and here and being able to look at those and be like this was a this was 100 years ago and here i am standing right here looking at um, that same arrangement today um, that's what really kind of that's what really kind of got me hooked mm -hmm. it was real real and now and today still we like to take those cards and then drive around i was out in um, on a hiking trail yesterday um, at Hornbeck's Creek in the recreation area. And I had a postcard from Hornbeck's Creek. And, you know, to be able to stand there and look at it and say a hundred years ago, people came to see this exact same view that I'm standing here looking at today. That's really cool. It is really neat. I just, I love being able to match the history timeline. Like, you yes. just, and you made a comment that in like 1915, German, the postcards weren't really made in Germany anymore. Right. But, we're kind of had, we're talking about World War One here. So it's right. kind of a surprise. Yeah, and first Germany dropped out of the market and then the other European countries dropped out of the market. And so we can see that, you know, kind of paralleling things that are going on in, in world history. Right, yeah, and global, on a global yeah. scale, for sure. Right, or even being able to get ammunition during World War II. Right, you know, right. Not being able to get ammo. Right. Um, yeah, they line up with history. And I think that's one of my favorite parts too. Yes. Um, here's another comment. This is, uh, I enjoyed the card showing the porch of the Water Gap house. I've read so much of Luke Broadhead's correspondence, including the price list of the furnishings of the inn. Oh, wow. Well, I will tell you that that came from one of our volunteers who's working on our letter collection. Oh, excellent. So you have that in your collection. We do. We do. So uh, we may have to schedule an appointment for you to come down. and. and I do, because some of those ladies were describing the furniture that was in their rooms. Right. There was two chairs and a small table and a, and a bed. Mm -hmm. um, so the furnishings are actually described. Right. Neat. Um, are you concerned about the commercial development taking place in the Poconos? Um, you know, I'm a resident of the Poconos. I've, I live here. Um, I'm born and raised in Warren County and then came across the river um, to go to college and married and stayed here. Um, and so um, I, you know, I live in Barrett Township, which is, which is a one traffic light town, a very rural community. Um, I don't mind driving places to get what I need because I, I prefer to live in that rural community. Um, I just think that it needs to be done um, wisely and in a way that we can sustain over time. Um, and it, it, it really has to be thought about um, so that we can also preserve and protect some of our other resources that are here. Sure, which draws I'm to the first Now I'm starting to sound too much like I'm at work and I am a <laughs> civilian tonight. 100% <laughs> civilian tonight. No, no, it's, that was good. I, I certainly understand. Yeah. Um, what is the title of the movie you were referring to with regard to the lead paint on the postcards? Oh, it's called Radium Girls. Um, I watched, I think I watched it on Netflix recently. It's, um, it's a, a really great story. And in this case, they were painting watch dials and clock dials that would glow in the dark using a, um, a, a radioactive paint. And so they were doing the very same thing where they were putting it in their mouths and then constantly being in contact with it. Um, and so that obviously caused them problems. So it's similar to that, but it was a great movie, a great um, historical movie. Oh, I've never heard of it. Now I got to add that to my list. Yeah. Where did you get all of these cards? All over the place. I mean, it's over 30 years. Um, we've purchased them in auctions. Um, we've purchased them in yard sales. Um, purchased them when we travel because Delaware Water Gap isn't always such a hot spot when you go other places. Um, we buy them online. Um, we've purchased um, collections. And uh, recently, um, I don't think my friend Debbie made it tonight, but um, about a year ago, I had a, a dear friend who um, kind of bequeathed her grandmother's collection to us to care for. And much of that collection was included in tonight's presentation. Um, and I was um, extremely lucky to, um, I can confirm, and I was lucky to um, have been able to meet two amazing women, Lucy Cosmerl and Clara Kaiser, who were um, some of the original members of the Delaware Water Gap Postcard Collectors Club of legend. Um, and both of them have passed, but they both 
um, allowed me to see and experience their collections. I learned from them. Um, they would give me all of the lists and the, you know, the checklists and things like that. Um, and I was able to purchase duplicates, only duplicates um, from them um, when they were both alive. And so I really appreciate um, that they took me under their wing. Um, I think they thought you know, I was the, the, young, the young kid um, and they really took me under their wing and shared a lot with me. And I really appreciate that. Um, well, as you, well you've as, always, and you've always loved and you've always loved history so it's natural to yeah, to yeah. Respect that. in fact it was the postcard collecting and that that really kind of triggered that history that encouraged me to go back to school wow. um, go back to ESU and then pursue two different two degrees in, in history wonderful do you have any postcards of the Howard Inn posting up to 25 along Delaware Avenue in Delaware Gap between the Bellevue and the Hillcrest that does not sound familiar. Um, it doesn't sound familiar to me either, but I do not. Mm -hmm. No, I don't believe I do. Howard in. Okay, well, just follow up on that one. Well, perfectly done, Kath. That's a message from Tara. <laughs> you have a lot of fans. Thank you so much for sharing your beautiful collection. I thought I was the only one that loves all of the different stories on the cards. I have so many cards with so many interesting stories from family and friends. I enjoyed the card showing the, oh, I already read that one. Okay, uh, I totally agree. We must preserve our nature here in the Poconos. Thank you, Kathleen, for all you do for our forest. Radium Girls is a fabulous movie, don't miss it. Do you have any images from Silver Lake Tea House in your collection? I believe I do. Yeah, I'd have to I'd have to look through the albums to pull that one out. Again, I'm always looking at I'm categorizing them on messages these days, so um, I'd have to go back and look. But I do believe I have a tea house. If you wanted to email me at the address that's up on the screen, um, I can take a look um, when I get a chance, and then um, possibly send you a scan or something. Great, great. Yeah. How do you sort your postcards? Well, I'll tell you what, I had a friend who offered to do it for me one time and she completely messed me up. <laughs> um, she had a very different organizational style. And so like a lot of folks know, there's all different types of cards. There's the Jesse Graves cards, which are their own thing. And so I had them all sorted. Um, there were my Graves cards in one album and then resorts and then different towns kind of geographically. Um, but then, um, you know, they got resorted and everything kind of got shuffled together in a in a different kind of way. Um, so I use acid-free albums and acid-free sleeves, um, double sleeves actually. There's a sleeve that the card is in and then they go in an album sleeve that's also acid-free. Um, and then those albums are based on basically geography. Um, but then I have a separate album that has all of the ones that just, when the message really stands out from me, I pull it out of the rest of the collection and put it in the message album. And that's the material that I go to. I have a postcard of Cold Air Cave. Any history on that? Um, yep, Cold Air Cave was a popular tourist attraction in the 1930s, one of those roadside attractions. Um, you can still go there today. Unfortunately, there's a lot of graffiti and that's one of the ways that you can find it. Um, it is on Route 611, just south of Delaware Water Gap. And the air temperature, it's not an actual cave. Um, it's the way the, the rocks, the talus slope have fallen off of the side of Mount Tammany and kind of stacked up. There's a lot of air pockets in there. And so it's basically a convection kind of thing. Um, but the air temperature in that cave is a steady 57 degrees, um, no matter what time of year it is. And so that was actually an attraction. Remember, lots of people came here to escape those sweltering hot city heat summer days. And so an attraction where you could feel 57 degree temperatures on an 80 degree day in the Poconos was quite popular. Um, a natural wonder. Right. And, and we have a, another comment about Polder that you can't enter because of special bat protections. Correct. Yep. Um, and regarding going back to the Howard Inn, it was apparently mentioned in um, Francis Drake's book. So now we got to go pull that off our shelves. Yep. It's right, I got it, but I'll have to look at right. it. Right. <laughs> uh, just a wonderful job always. Love hearing you, love recognizing a few of the postcards. That was very nice. Um, everything looked good. I love, 
love to see the, you know, more postcards, see them even on in larger format, you know, to really get some of the detail. Right. Yeah. Nice too. Yep. Okay. Oh, we have one more question. Okay. I'm so my eighth grade teacher out there. Hi, Mrs. <laughs> Lund. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are some things you've learned from collecting the cards? Um, a lot of, like, you really get to see our area in a different way, right? So now that I've seen these pictures from the past and kind of experienced them through other people's eyes and other people's words, when you go places, you notice things, um, you see things differently. You drive down Main Street in Stroudsburg and you notice the historic sites a whole lot more often. You drive, even when you go to other places, you see things and it makes you kind of wonder and want to learn about them. Um, and I think that that's, that's probably one of my other favorite parts about it is that you get to go, um, it opens your eyes to things and helps you to see how things used to be. I saw the Indian head on one of the cards. Any comment on that? I'm sorry, say that again. I saw the Indian head on one of the cards. Do you have any comment on that? Mm -hmm. The one on Mount Tammany, I'm guessing. Um, that is a super popular feature in cards. Um, I do have one. Um, I didn't actually use it in the presentation tonight, but um, it's somebody commenting. It's a picture of the Indian head from the Pennsylvania side. It's a great image. And it's somebody trying to point it out to the person that they're writing to and saying, if you look up there, it is shaped like an Indian and it really looks real. I've seen it in person. It really looks like he's just really trying to convince somebody Somebody. And as somebody who has stood out there at Point of Gap Overlook and tried to convince people sometimes, I'm like, no, no, it, it is. It's, it's there. Look, it's right there. There's the nose. There's the head. Um, so I understand that's sometimes hard for people to pick out. Um, you got to have a little bit of an imagination, but um, still a very popular view today and still probably one of the best sellers in local postcards is that Indian head view. I believe it. I believe it. Yep. Great. All right, I think we did pretty good here. You got, you got a lot of questions. I know, great questions, thank you. Yeah. Yes, I'm um, just kind of reviewing and making sure I didn't miss any. Looks good. There's probably about 10 other different ways I could slice and dice this presentation and so many other messages that I could share. We could focus on you know, just Jesse Graves cards or we could focus on just a specific time period. Um, there's just so much material out there. It just well, I think we covered all covered in an hour, so. Right, no, and I think we all have a, a better appreciation and can, it really helps us to even date our postcards and, and take the time to, to flip them over, not just enjoy the, the artwork on them, but the right. history that's written on the back as well. Yep, it really can kind of open your eyes and just, if, if nothing else, it'll make you laugh too. Some of them are just like hysterical. They Too-y are. People. That's me <laughs> up. Thank you so much for sharing your collection with us. Thanks, Amy. Taking time this evening. We certainly appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Take care.